now women kind of have to do another job of like unpacking the subtext. I always want to look at the label, which for some reason irritates waiters. My family looks like it was engineered for the Russian steps when the Cossacks are coming. Hello and welcome to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft and in this final episode in season two, we're going to be indulging ourselves a little as we explore eating and maybe a little drinking too. Literature has long been stuffed with food and drink, and today we'll be having our fill of both as we hear from Lara Williams about appetite and subversion, from Michael Palin about eating around the world, and in the studio we're joined by a man whose voice will be very familiar to those who tune into Radio 4's The Kitchen Cabinet. It's The Guardian's restaurant critic and feature writer and author, Jay Rayner. Welcome, Jay. Thank you for having me. It's an delighted absolute, to be here. Well, it's a complete pleasure. I'm also, of course, joined by my co-host, Holly. Hi, Holly. Hello. Are you feeling peckish today? Always. Good. There will be. We will have actual food. No, there seems, is some food. I can see it from here. It seems, well... Exactly. I'm a professional. I can spot food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jay, your new book, My Last Supper, it's a book with one of those simple ideas that completely hooks you from the first page. Rather than me explaining what it is, why don't you say... It is the answer to the question I've been asked most regularly during the question-answer session at my live events, which is, imagine you're on death row, what would your last meal be? And I've always said I'd probably have lost my appetite. And having thought about all the people who are eligible for last meals, and not a happy lot, the <laughs> suicidal, the terminally ill, I, I concluded that actually none of them are really suited to eating a last meal. But the idea, which is slightly different, is very good. The idea is... If there were no consequences, if nobody could judge you the next day, if you didn't have to hate yourself, if you were going to make a meal that was put together from the dishes which represented your memories and who you are, what would you have? And I thought I would refuse to let the small matter of the fact that I'm nowhere near death, (laughs) that was me tapping wood, get in the way of me having this meal. So I go out in pursuit of the ingredients. Each chapter is named for an ingredient. Um and tell the stories behind them. So really, it's a vehicle for memoir, because Mm. I think memory and food sit hand in hand. They absolutely are. And this is what I loved about reading the book, was that you sort of effortlessly take us on this kind of little tour of your life, uh, glimpses of your childhood, and how you, I suppose, how you met some of these ingredients. Yeah, sure. I'm going to say seemingly seemingly effortlessly, (laughs) because I put an awful lot of effort into that, Will. I will bet you did. (laughs) You make it look easy. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I am fascinated by the construction of narratives. Way back in my book writing career, such as it is, I reached a conclusion, which is that nobody reads a book to find out how it finishes. Okay. If you are really into a book, you don't want it to finish. You're there to be deep into it. You mm-hmm. want it, and, and the worst moment is when you suddenly look and realise, oh, I've only got 40 pages to go. So my job as a writer, and anything I write, is to want you to keep reading mm. and to build a narrative in a way which is encouraging to that and, and draws you in. Before we get to some of the ingredients, I wonder, Holly, if you uh, were asked this question, like, what would your, your final meal be if you had to pick one? It's a bit tough, I know. She's having, look, she's having... She a, has, her hand has gone over her mouth as though thinking. nothing will pass it. There'd be a starter of garlic bread, oh. I think, and then... Good garlic bread or really cheap garlic bread from a supermarket? No, like a doughy pizza garlic bread. A couple of slices think, of that. I think we know what you're talking about here. Yeah. You're basically mm. talking about Pizza Express. Other brands right? are available. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> other pizzerias are available. Bit of garlic butter yeah. and then followed by roast dinner. It's got What to kind? Be. What's the, what, yeah, what's your what, meat? I mean, are we lamb, are we beef, are we chicken? There are many... Let's go with beef. Okay. Because that was always my favourite as a child. So mm-hmm. I feel like it would be nice to come full circle. Mm-hmm. You're not Lots. really going to be dead after this, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> Lots of Yorkshire puddings, crispy okay. potatoes, lots of honey roasted parsnips, pigs in blankets, stuffing. Hang on, hang on. You actually want Christmas dinner, don't you? Kind of. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what you're after. And maybe mince you want, pies you want, you, for pudding. You want, kind of, you want a kind of crossover. Who is this cooked by? Because My it, mum. Your mum. Absolutely, okay. yes. This is great. Will? Will? Oh, oh no, I didn't expect the question to be put to me. <laughs> you I mean, can't just throw it out there without expecting it to come back. Oh, that's a real problem. So, um, if I'm absolutely honest, I think that when I have something incredible, like you just described that roast dinner, and what I was thinking there was like, it's all about the roast potatoes, because if they're right, that just absolutely makes the meal. So I do like the simplicity of something like steak and chips. So I think a, a really high quality steak with absolutely perfect thin string chips uh, maybe a little bit of 
sort of um, watercress on the side, mm. uh, and and a good I like a good butter, like a herb butter, or in fact, Jane and I were just discussing on the way up here black garlic. So mm. I made some black garlic butter once for a steak, and it really was absolutely gorgeous. So there you go, I'll go for that. All right, and a glass of very very nice red wine. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, um, for many New Year's Eves, when, when our, my kids were small, um, my wife and I got absolutely, we just couldn't bear the complexities of New Year's Eve parties. So we would stay at home. Okay. And we would, and it was steak and chips. And the other thing was, you go to parties on New Year's Eve, and you take a really good bottle, mm-hmm. and it disappears into the party, you never get to drink it. Yeah. So I would buy the best bottle of Bordeaux that I felt I could afford, yeah. and then we would drink it. Very nice. That's much better. I know. I have that thing as well of taking a bottle. I'm like, yeah, but I want that. Yes. I don't want it to disappear into your wine rack. Um, we will get to wine a little bit later. But before we get to there, what I loved, was, again, the simplicity of the ingredients that you were picking in this book. Um, you do mention things like oysters and snails. Your chapter on snails, because it, it draws on a story of you having them for the first time with your mum. Yeah. No, um, no. Uh, well, yeah, I did have them with my parents. The oysters I had for the first time. First time with your mum. Yes. With my mum. The snails sort of refers to my family as well. In a restaurant not far from where we're sitting. So we're on Piccadilly at the yeah. moment. And just over on Panton Street was a restaurant called Stone's Chop House, where they love to set fire to most things. <laughs> it, um, they, they did the old table service, yeah. flambe and all of that. And it was um, originally a coffee house when it opened in 1780. And by the 70s, quite a glamorous spot owned mm. by the Savoy. I had a stupidly privileged childhood. <laughs> in all in all senses. Um, but I just loved... I, I remember my mother saying that I, I got the hang of the tongs. Yeah. Because you're, you're drawn to squeeze the tongs when you're in, in your hand and you're trying to pull the snail out. But if you do that, the snail is released and will fly across the room. <laughs> the shell will go on a parabola. And so you have to learn to keep your, 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 your wrist loose, not too much pressure, get in... And then you've got to tip the, oil, the the butter out onto the plate, yes. mop it with the bread. Your description of the bubbling green flecked butter on those mm. plates made me want snails so badly as I was reading that chapter. Well, we're not far from where I, I found the best one because I go on this. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to give too many of the, the, the narrative <laughs> clips and turns away. But, you know, I go all the way to Paris, obviously, in search of the best snails. And I'm mostly disappointed and realised that actually they're all back home. Mm. They're in London, they're mm. in Soho. Well, we are going to move to another area of food now, which is probably, I mean, possibly the most simple, which is bread. And you describe your sort of your search to find the perfect loaf of bread. Now, as somebody who loves bread, I loved that chapter. You mentioned, actually, that you have to be a bit careful with bread because you can quite happily... Uh, well, I, I can. I mean, you know, um, people look at me and think that, you know, I'm a big man and that, that I, I'm a big man because I'm a restaurant critic. No, <laughs> I'm a big man because... I'm Jay Rayner, and I've always been a big man. <laughs> uh, my family looks like it was engineered for the Russian steps when the Cossacks are coming. For the winters, where well, you need a sluggish metabolism, so that whatever food you take on sticks with you and yeah. will get you through. Um, and so I go to the gym a lot to mitigate the impacts of my of my stupid job. Um, and I, I, I'm not in any way a keto diet or anything like that. I just avoid certain amounts of carbs when I can. Mm. Um, and bread is one of those things, you know, it, I don't I don't eat an awful lot of it, partly because I like it too much. It's Well, it is. It's delicious. And you mentioned a, a loaf that you come across, which is from the Brickhouse Bakery, which have very kindly delivered a loaf to this studio. I know. And it's sitting there. It's the country white. The country white. It looks amazing. And what's interesting about this loaf is that in the book, I go all the way to San Francisco to meet a, a very influential baker, um, a guy called... Chad Robertson, who has a restaurant in San Francisco called Tartine. Um, San Francisco uh, sourdough is a cult. Mm-hmm. It is the one true loaf. They even think they invented it because at one point, um, men in white coats, men and women in white coats went and analysed the bacterial, uh, the bacteria which gives it the lactic acid flavour. And once they found it, they, they caught, gave it San Franciscus as part of its name, <laughs> Bacillus San Francisco, whatever it is. It turned out that it's not native to San Francisco. It's all over the world. Okay. <laughs> but it, it's like San Franciscans own it. Now, this loaf was one I'd been eating from the market at the end of my road mm. in Hern Hill every Sunday. It's a classic middle-class farmer's market, place you go for a, an emergency pulled pork bun, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and they, they have a stand. Um, and it turned out, I mentioned that I ate this bread, and it went, oh, yeah, Fergus, he, uh, he came and trained with me. So this bread, it's not the same, and that's what's really interesting. Uh, there are some people who just go and see, spend time with Chad, and then attempt to 
recreate the tartine mm. loaf. Mm. Uh, Fergus Jackson did not attempt to recreate it. He created his own. Um, I mean, obviously, it's on the spectrum of sourdoughs, but it's beautiful. It's got a, a crust. He describes at one point his favourite thing to do with it is just cut off the end and eat it like it's pork crackling. Yes, you mm. see, I'm a big fan of the heel. I, uh, that's what the I heel. want. Um, and then there's a loose crumb. Uh, and the other thing about these loaves that I absolutely love is they are sort of living things. Um, whereas a sliced loaf will sort of die on you within about three, four, five days. You can keep one of these for two weeks. And, really? Yeah, and by the end, yeah, of course, it will start to be different, it'll be yeah. hard. But you, if, you can, if you can slice it up, it still makes fantastic toast. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you can bring it back to life. It won't go, because it's such a sort of vivid, dynamic object, it won't go mouldy. Or if it does, don't eat it. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's just got a, it, it changes in, in form and, and texture and taste. We're going to have to have some. Although I'm looking at Holly, and, and Holly, you've brought your own loaf, haven't you? Because I have. It's got to be gluten free for you. It's a very sad loaf of bread it's, that is joining us. It is sliced, as has, has been mentioned. Mm. But I think we're going to have to taste this bread. What we're going to do is we're going to hear from another author as we snack on our bread. Of course, with bread, you need to have butter. Yeah. You have a lovely search for butter in the book, and you find this great butter from Northern Ireland called yes. Abernethy butter. Northern Ireland features quite heavily in the book. Mm. Um, three of the things that end up on the table, I'll give all of them away, but one of them is the butter. The made by a brilliant couple called Will and Alison Abernethy um, and it's not some result of great pursuit of the perfect perfect butter mm. they just made it the way um, I think it's Will's grandmother made it and the result is oh. just sublime yeah it's so good that I went to Fortnum and Mason's who stock it and they had sold out of these standard sort of salted butter so we have a smoked butter the smoked butter and actually it's a brilliant thing when I went I, I, I made butter with them yeah. for, for the book and I asked Will how he went through the process of smoking butter. And he said, oh, I just made it up. <laughs> I just, you know, tried a few things. And yeah. It, there was no technique. We it, was are, no, it was just brilliant. Yeah. Well, we're about to discover what that has uh, made. But um, whilst we're doing that, you can listen to Michael Palin. Um, his new book is his North Korean Journal, which is the book that accompanies the TV series that he made recently. Uh, and it shows what happens when you take the world's nicest man and send him to a super secretive surveillance state. Um, I spoke to him uh, about a year ago talking about all sorts of things, but he told me a bit about how food helps to break barriers um, and about his own relationship from travelling all over the world. Sharing food is another thing, a bit like having a sense of humour or, or talking about a family. It's a great way of breaking down barriers, probably the best way of all, because someone has created something for you and I do find that wherever I've been in the world especially in the poorer places we don't expect people to have very much they will provide a meal for you they just it's, it's just that's the way they do it you know and it's a simple meal and it's always terrific well yeah pretty much always terrific so in, in that sense sharing food is, is very very important I also like you know I, li I like the conviviality of a table sitting at a table it doesn't have to be anywhere smart, it doesn't even have to be posh food or anything like that. Just sharing sharing food and drink is a great way to sort of meet, talk, converse. I'm a, I mean, I would spend my time lunching if I could, but I have to do a bit of work. And <laughs> lunch usually sort of lays me flat, but I do still go and see. I, I really relish meeting up with friends for lunch. Friends who are not necessarily working together on anything like that, just... just f friends you might otherwise forget. So it's a very good way of bringing me, um, bringing me together with people. And I like the process. I, I don't cook myself, but I'm a great appreciator of, of food um, and drink too. You know, I've always enjoyed a drink. I've slightly changed my taste now. It used to be, Python days, it used to be gin and tonic very heavily because Graham Chapman was into into gin and tonics very heavily, and so we will some gin and tonics and beer. So now I probably have slightly less. I'd have some wine uh, and, a, and a scotch or something. But again, that's something which is, to me, very, very important. Uh, wine has a sense of place, you know. It's not just drinking a bottle of wine. I want to always want to look at the label, which for some reason irritates waiters in restaurants. <laughs> Excuse me, could I see the bottle? And they think you're going to, well, what's, but not, what's wrong with it? No, no, I just want to see where it comes from. Ah, yes, yeah. Menorca, that's very interesting. But so I like wine, uh, I like the sense of place that you get from wine mm. um, and whiskey particularly. I mean, it's just, I love going out to Scotland and just going to a few distilleries and having the whiskey up there. 
it gives you again, again a great sense of of what makes this place distinctive from another place mm. and all that. I was going to say there's that distinctive taste that comes from the different parts of, of Scotland and, and Ireland, of course. Yes. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And I think if you if you appreciate that, it's the same as appreciating good painting or something like that. It's it's something you found for yourself that really particularly delights you. Mm. <laughs> Do you, do you have a, I mean, as you say, you don't cook a lot yourself, but you, you enjoy the food. Is, is there, I mean, do you have a favourite meal? If, if, you, if you had to sort of pick one meal to have tonight, what, what, what would be on the table? Um, well, it'd probably be, uh, I'd say it'd probably be Italian, uh, just because I know one or two Italian chefs who are just absolutely brilliant, um, have a lightness of touch, you know, of, of uh, pasta, which is just superb, and, and the sauces and just all that. So I probably would go for that just because I know it well. But then um, I've had food all over the world, which I've been surprised at how much I've enjoyed it. I mean, in North Korea recently, um, kimchi, which is a thing they eat all the time. And I thought, oh God, I've had this before. And it's, it's rather sort of, you know, pickled cabbage and all that. That's all it is. But it isn't that at all. It's lots of different things in different places. Again, it's a bit like the different scotches you get in different parts of Scotland, mm. kimchi can be different um, all over Korea. And, and so that's, yes, I, I will remember a certain place because that did the best, kimchi. Yeah, so difference is important, distinction is important. Mm. Oh, that is a serious crust. Mm. It's so nice. Oh my god, mm. that butter is something else. Isn't it? Mm. This bit is either going to be really nice to listen to <laughs> or really gross as you hear us masticating mm. smoked butter. So if wow. you don't like uh, eating noises, it's your problem. <laughs> and the bread is incredible because as you say, it's got that amazing crust, mm -hmm. but the, the bread inside has got this light open texture because sourdough can sometimes be really heavy, mm. quite hard to eat, but this is absolutely wonderful. It is, it's lovely. It's got, absolutely lovely. But it does have that kind of sour tang. Anyway, as Michael was saying there, travelling around the world, what he enjoys, I suppose, is that the specificity of food that comes from particular places. And, and yeah, the thing that really struck me was he was talking about how people open up. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, that in a way is the principle behind my podcast, which mm -hmm. is if you get a famous person who's used to being interviewed, but then you put them at a restaurant table and then you just get them to talk mm. usually they forget about the microphone within about 10 minutes mm. and they really do talk um but also you know in, in the context of, of this book of mine um memories are made round tables we build our narratives one plate at a time it's about you know how our parents looked after us when we were children um holly you were talking about you know it had to be your mum who made a rose lunch and I'll be honest, I have no idea, maybe she's an absolutely brilliant cook, but I suspect that the most important thing was that act of her, the performative thing almost, of her cooking for you, an act of parenting, mm. which is the ultimate act of parenting. Mm. Absolutely. He mentioned there about wine as well, and that sort of thing of, he likes to look at the label of the wine and see where it's come from. I have a bottle of wine that I want to show you, Jay. Do you now? I'm reaching under my desk now. See, the, the, the wine, or the alcohol chapter in my book is, uh, is personally, I think, the most complicated one. Well, it's very, so that chapter is very interesting. So you get the chance to drink possibly some of oh. the finest wines known to humanity. I, know, I literally do. Um, came, came out of, I knew it was going to be good, but I didn't know it was going to be that good. Which is, I mean, as somebody who likes a bit of red wine, I read that chapter so enviously. Shall I explain the story to this? Please do. All right, so... Actually, as I'm going through talking about my relationship with alcohol of all kinds, I realise that I'm probably nowhere near as committed to it, the good stuff, as I should be. Mm. That, you know, I like that wine and that, and I, I don't really know what that is, and, you know, I'm, I'm not very good at getting totally drunk. Anyway, and then I run into this guy, Rich Avery, he's an actor, um, and we know each other a little bit on Twitter. Um, and he says that his dad was quite big in the wine business. He died, but they wanted to hold a dinner. Maybe he, I'd like to come. And I actually say, well, this might be a really good way for me to understand the emotional relationship with wine. Mm. So we reverse it. He comes to my house. Uh, I cook the food. He and his family and a bunch of very serious wine people bring the wines. And oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, you're right. I did. I'm, I'm, I don't want to reveal exactly what they all were, no. but they were that phrase from Withnail and I: "The greatest wines known to humanity 
They literally were in they certain really cases. Were. Yeah. I mean, just incredible. The, 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 the kind of names that you hear mentioned in sort of posh movies or when there's usually a story where somebody accidentally orders one in a restaurant and doesn't know how much it yeah. actually costs. Yeah, exactly. But you got to drink them. Now, the budget for the Waterstones podcast does not allow me to reach that far. However... Yeah. Talking of reading labels, what is the name that's on this label oh, of wine? Oh, right. Well, that's Avery's of Bristol. That is Avery's wine. Yeah. So Rich Avery's um, father, John Avery, was uh, Avery's of Bristol is one of the great um, wine merchants of Britain. Um, interestingly, uh, it was John Avery who really introduced the big um, New World, as they were called, Australian wines, mm. and said, you know, Penfolds, for example, is a brilliant, brilliant... He was the one who championed them. And it was his grandfather who brought the big French labels like Petrus mm. into the UK as well. Um, and that's who we were celebrating. So it wasn't that surprising that he had the most ridiculous um, <laughs> seller. So, it, it was absurd. So I have a surprise for you, which is you mentioned there that Rich Avery is an actor. Yeah. So at the time that you were drinking this wine, he was in Warhorse in the West End. Yes, he was. Yeah. Well, what you don't know is that sat next to him in the dressing room was me. Are you joking? I was also in Warhorse at the time. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that's... Uh, I mean, so Rich had this habit of... He, he played a captain, didn't he? Played, he? So he played Captain Nichols. I played Captain Stewart. So we sat next to each other in the dressing room, yeah. And, uh, and his, his habit was of sitting on the front of the stage and he was meant to be sketching and he took to sketching whatever he could see in the audience and that night he sketched me. <laughs> well, he didn't. He sketched... A t- it was a terrible drawing of a bird, which he said was a jay. Okay, and oh, I see. that's what he tweeted to me. There and it turned go. out that we we're all quite local to each other yeah. and so forth. So there you go. It's all connected, Joe. It really is all connected. Well, that's, yeah. uh, that's lovely. Um, yeah, it, and Rich actually was at... Uh, so I, I did, as we're speaking, it was just a week after I did the first of my live shows mm. of My Last Supper. Um, and he came to that. So. And how, how do your live shows work? Because they're, as you were saying... They're they have developed, just... okay. actually. So if I go back to the original reason that I came up with them, I wrote a book back in 2013 called Greedy Man in the Hungry World about genuine definitions of food sustainability. And I knew as I finished it that it was fodder for discussion panels at literary festivals. And I hate them. <laughs> I think they're reductive and difficult. And I don't... I, I just... I don't like being on them, let alone... You know, I just don't like being in the audience, let alone being on them. Mm. I thought the only way to get around this was to come up with my own one-man show. So when anybody said, would you go on discussion panel, I'd say, no, but I have this one-man show. And actually, it ended up touring the country through most of the small theatres you must have played at some point in your career. <laughs> I'm guessing. Unless you went straight to the West I'm End. Strictly with, West End, darling. Strictly That's West right. End, all right. <laughs> At the end of 18 months, I, I discovered it had become quite a, a part of my life. So I came up with another one. Then I wrote, uh, that was about terrible restaurant experiences, my dining hell. And then... Uh, third one, Ten Fuku Moments. And they all use audiovisual stuff. Mm. Um, a little bit like Dave Gorman does on Modern Life is Goodish. Um, firing off gags. They are not a reading. They are a performance piece. A couple of them being close to stand-up comedy. But this one, My Last Supper, is in some ways the most complex because it's really built around five monologues. Mm-hmm. Um, my props list for each venue is two chairs and a bar stool. <laughs> And that has to create everything from Rules Restaurant to a brothel in Amsterdam to the front seat of a Turkish bus. Um, and I'm playing, playing those parts. Um, and so the first half is about 50, 55 minutes. Yeah. But at the end, I'm asking the audience to tweet me their last suppers. Okay. Um, and we talk about that after the, after the interval. Fantastic. So it's a lot of fun. It's theatre, really, is what you're saying. It is. Thinking. This yeah. one, there is no pretending anymore. This one really is theatre. Mm. Um, so I had a long sort of debrief with Rich Avery afterwards. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm touring the country um, and we'll keep touring the country. And if anybody wants to see a show, if they go to jrainer.co.uk, all the links are there. Do you see what I did there? It's very, mm. very subtle. Mm. I liked it. Well, at this stage, we're going to hear from another author now, uh, whose debut novel, Supper Club, looked at a group of women challenging the accepted norms of appetite while celebrating the power of female friendship. I asked Laura Williams about the inspirations behind her subversive debut novel. One of the uh, main ideas that um, uh, that I was thinking about was the idea of appetite um, and um, eating as kind of, and, and food as one of the kind of key appetites, but sort of thinking about um, an appetite for food as maybe a kind of symbolic for kind of a broader sense of how we kind of manage our appetites. Um, and I was thinking about this sort of like primal scream sort of exposure therapy theory of sort of aggressively leaning into something or embodying it in order to reach a sort of new- neutral state with it. Um, so what happens if you kind of almost hysterically lean into something? Um, and um, it came from this idea that um, that I had that... Um, 
I've, for a long time had this strange theory that um, like the cure for my my occasional sh- like sort of tendency towards shyness would be to take an improv class. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was the sort of driving idea. Did you ever take that improv class? Um, no, because I'm really scared it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a reclamation of an a- of appetite and the idea of kind of um, suppressing appetites and particularly an appetite for food and kind of managing your appetite for food being quite a kind of normalised thing, um, particularly for women. Um, it is so kind of ordinary for us to think about the different ways we can manage our appetite, the different ways we can manage our diet. Um, it's so embedded even in the language in which we talk about in kind of terms of like good foods or bad foods. Um, and they're just trying to reclaim that and um, and sort of reclaim it to kind of uh, even go beyond reclaiming it, um, sort of lean into it as far as they can. You you have actual recipes yes. in the book, and uh, how did you go about deciding what those would be, and and how to write about those recipes? Um, the first one I wrote was a section on caramelising onions, and it's on the different sort of theories for caramelising onions. So there's like the Momofuku method for caramelising onions, and the Julia Child um, method for caramelising onions, um, and um, I quite sort of like slightly instinctively just began writing these different methods for caramelizing onions um, and I and I was interested in almost testing a, a reader's patience in terms of like how much methodical and kind of meticulous detail I could kind of put them through um, and that felt to me quite a sort of like masculine writerly tendency um, and I was quite interested in sort of like how I as an author maybe like take up space on the page and kind of putting a reader through their paces so that was my first idea and that was maybe more kind of particular to that section. And then I like the idea of um, having recipes, or not, they're not necessarily recipes, they're often more kind of like embodied experiences of following a recipe, or kind of meditations on a recipe, um, and sort of thinking about how they might fit thematically at particular moments in the story. So there's a part um, in which um, Roberta is sort of settling down or kind of like hurrying towards settling down um, and achieving this kind of like sense of normalcy um, that she really craves Um, and at that point there's um, a recipe for Thai red curry but it's quite a sort of simplified and anglicised version of that recipe and I thought it was the sort of thing you might make to kind of perform to yourself that you're kind of an urbane like grown up Um, so yeah they sort of sit sit thematically like that. I mean did you find your own attitudes to um, appetite and, and food changing as you were writing the book? I didn't consciously notice anything but then I also did give up a decade worth of veganism in the duration of um, writing the book so I think subconsciously something must have happened. <laughs> <laughs> and is that still the case? You, you, you've still, you haven't gone back on the wagon of being a vegan? No I'm, I'm vegetarian but okay. yeah, not a vegan. Yeah. That, isn't that interesting though that through, <laughs> through the idea of writing about the the transgressive act of eating that you transgressed your own boundary yeah and I I also um I was like even though at the time when I started writing it I I was vegan and I was like quite a strict vegan um but I was very conscious that meat eating had to be part of the supper club because I wanted there to be kind of a conscious transgression and something that kind of like pushed beyond the borders of like maybe what I would consider sort of morally okay um and I thought that felt quite necessary to like any kind of book that deals with transgression I think um, that language is sort of becoming even more kind of deeply encoded in the ways we talk about food. So the idea of like Weight Watchers is now like wellness watchers, um, but everyone understands that it is Weight Watchers and you can almost see like weight, like sort of hovering invisibly sort of behind wellness um, and that now women kind of have to do another job of like unpacking the subtext of what those things mean. So wellness now is like immediately associated with thinness and um, and I just feel like it's it's just kind of becoming more and more subtextual, um, but it's but it's even kind of more apparent and glaring than ever in some ways. Um, so it just seems that there's there's so much more unpacking of those kind of codes and ideas um, and values that women have to do. Before we get started, I just want to mention how amazing the jacket art for Supper mm. Club is. Um, it's something that we don't often talk about with books. I know we talked about it earlier in the season with Anne Patchett mm. about her jacket design, but Supper Club has this amazing fist which is grabbing a handful of blackberries and the juices are just dribbling down the hand and wrist and it just is fantastic. It's, very it's so good. good. I just want to, because that thing about, particularly for women, this language that surrounds food, and the pressures of sort of 
this idea of good food, things that are good for you, bad oh. for you, guilty pleasures, that kind of stuff. Clean eating, dirty eating. I, I, food does not have morality. No. Mm. It really doesn't. Um, the pathologizing of language around food drives me nuts. Now, I sometimes run the other way and, and d- d- create a persona built around enthusiasm. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm not embarrassed about that. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, I think once you get into a book link thing, so that's the persona of my restaurant reviews, and it is sort of me, but not quite me. Um, I think you have to be a little more open and honest about the who you actually are. So there's a whole chapter in my book, for example, about salad. Mm. Um, and my, my younger son saying to me, why, why, salad in the last supper, why? <laughs> and, and really that chapter is all about another one of those phrases, self-care, looking after yourself as a man in my 50s, uh, probably with more gone than is to go. Um, you know, one reflects on these things. But it does bother me that we do pathologise food in that way. Yeah. Um, mm. Has Weight Watchers really become wellness watchers? It's, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's called <gasps> WW now. So they, they've tried to sort of take away this idea that it's about weight. But as Laura was saying, th- they, the message is there. We all mm. know that when people talk about wellness, what they're really doing is just rebranding weight restriction and sort yeah. of food restriction, mm. restrictive eating of all kinds. One of the interesting things Laura was saying, though, um, about recipes yeah. in, in prose. So... Um, uh, don't take the wrong way because we are above a bookshop and you have a fine collection of them. But the modern cookbook is pretty much an artefact these days. Yeah. The photographs are beautiful. I've got loads of them. I love them and I, you know, flick through them. But there is a certain knowledge that you will never be able to recreate the food that is described in a way that it's photographed, which makes those books an invitation to fail. Yeah. Mm. My books now do contain recipes but they are written, uh, I suspect, I haven't read Lois' book, and I'm going to, but uh, in, in a way that drives the narrative onwards, and mm. they are part of the narrative story. Right at the end of the first chapter, I give a recipe for a, uh, it's a brilliant sort of breakfast brunch dish of chorizo and tomatoes and eggs, and I say, and you bake it, and I then say, and um, what you need to do is get a, a bag of tortilla chips and eat it with those but if you really can't be bothered with the whole of the recipe just buy a bag of tortilla chips and eat those while you continue to read <laughs> and it's it's kind of saying look we're here it's fine yeah you know mm. and if you don't want to actually make this stock from scratch just buy it it's fine <laughs> um, you can set the mood because a lot of there's a lot of prescription and Welcome to my beautiful life. Yeah, 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 yeah. My life is not beautiful. It's as messy and as ragged and uncertain as everybody's life. And I'm very, very wary of lying about that. I have an image of the crumbs at the bottom of a bag of tortilla chips now. As somebody who's been through a whole bag on my own, I, I, I know what you're saying. You basically saying, don't. mean Doritos, don't you? I, 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 you really do. do you no, know, actually, I I'm not a fan of Doritos because no, I, I don't like the, <laughs> I don't, I don't like the flavours, but I, I like them plain. I like a, a, do you just like them plain? Yeah, I like a salted... Tortilla chip. If there's such a thing as a vanilla tortilla chip, that's, that's what you like. That's the one, I'm afraid. I'm very, <laughs> very vanilla. I'm very vanilla. <laughs> well, listen, at the end of this fantastic meal, what we need are the petty fours of podcasting, our bookseller recommendations. So here they are with the books that should be on your TBR pile, inspired by the theme of eating. Hi, I'm Lucy from Exeter, and a great book to read about eating would be An Echo of Scandal by Laura Madeline. Madeline's books are a clever blend of history and mystery, and food plays a big role in each of them, influencing character and plot in a way I've never seen before. In her latest novel, it is the cooking of a specific dish that results in Ali, a young Spanish woman, being framed for murder. Fleeing her home disguised as a boy, she finds herself in Tangier at the height of the decadent twenties. What follows is an incredible tale of mistaken identity danger and romance, all underpinned by exquisite prose. Hi, I'm Martha from Sheffield, and the book I'd like to recommend on the theme of eating is An Apple a Day by Emma Wolfe. In part, this is a very moving, inspirational memoir of the author's recovery from anorexia, but it's also a celebration of reclaiming food and eating as an affirmation of being alive. Hi, I'm Emily from Barnsley, and on the theme of it for eating, I would recommend The Best of A.A. Gill, which is a collection of his writing, from his restaurant reviews to television to travel writing. It's utterly hilarious. He's devastatingly charming, and you definitely don't want him at your dinner party. He famously having written, saying that if you're at a dinner party and you don't like the food, you can send it back. You would love to be sitting next to him, though. Definitely also read his review of The Teletubbies. Jay, thank you for making our mouths water. Um, thank you for that bread. I'm not sure I can 
Well, yeah. the bread's going home with you because it's not going to be allowed into my it's house. A... <laughs> so I would just chomp my way through it. I don't want you to get into any trouble. No. Um, Holly, thank you for bringing your own bread. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for the butter. Oh, my God, that smoke butter. That's something Can else. Can we have it for lunch? Yeah, yeah that's yours. Great. That's, that's you got, awesome. Yeah. You've got bread, we'll you've got that. butter, you've got everything you need. Uh, and thank you to you, the listener. As I mentioned, this is the last episode in Season 2, and therefore it's the last chance for you to influence what might appear in Season 3 when it airs next year. If you have an idea for a theme that you would like us to cover, then do please email it to us on social at waterstones.com. We've had some very interesting suggestions so far. Uh, I can tell you that we have already recorded a couple of authors who are very exciting, but I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, It's a bit early to be wishing you all a happy Christmas, but we won't be back until the new year. So in that case, have a good one, eat plenty, and we'll see you in 2020. Bye. Bye. Bye Farewell. Thank you.